All right. Nader Sabri, a leading voice in innovation who has directly raised 20 million in venture capital and over 100 million for startups he has advised or co-founded. Writer of two books, Ready, Set, Grow, Hack, Hack and Grow Thinking, which is a nice segue to the topic of today. How can corporate innovators grow hack better? Nader, um, thanks for being here. How are you today? Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Nice sunny day. Can't complain. All right. Yeah, you're based in Dubai, I believe. It's, Today I'm uh, based in Dubai. That's right. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. Great. Um, well, I would say today we want to talk a little more about growth hacking. I have prepared uh, a couple of questions and I will say let's uh, start with the first one. Um, it's about your book, uh, Ready, Set, Growth Hacker, which is a bestseller, uh, I believe. You sold yes. uh, many copies of those. Um, and in this book, you explain the concept of growth hacking and why companies need it. Um, after that, you decided to write a second book, Grow Think Thinking, that focused specifically on growth uh, thinking design and techniques. Um, what inspired you to start writing those books? Sure. So the story goes a, a, a little bit further back and, and it's actually very personal and very emotional. And I think a lot of people in your audience can relate to it as well in the sense of uh, entrepreneurship and starting new projects and so forth. And like most people, um, when you're very eager about something new, especially something entrepreneurial or innovation, um, you start to go read books, right? So you'll go read the books and listen to the podcast and you'll talk to the consultants and you're very eager to learn as much as you can. And the problem with that, and that's not a bad thing to do. I mean, we should all do that. But the point though is that everywhere you run into some kind of thought leadership, usually you're given a formula. And they say, well, this is the formula for this, or this is the way to do that. And the problem with that is most of us are conditioned to believe that. So we buy into that, right? I, I read a book and, and all of a sudden I'm like, wow, this has got to be the way to do it. And what do I do? I, I do what everyone else does. I go implement it and I don't get the same results. <laughs> if I'm lucky, in some cases, I don't get any results. And so it's like, I've done something wrong, right? And you get really upset with yourself, right? And you're like, this is just not working. I, I go read another book, right? And, and so I watch another podcast. And so very early on in my career, I had discovered something very important about this point, which was there is no silver bullet. Uh, there is no single success formula. Um, whatever anyone was is telling you, there's a misconception in the language they're using. And that misconception is this is how I got the results. I'll show you how I did it, but you can learn from it. And rarely do people put that bias up front because it's not it doesn't sell well. <laughs> it doesn't sell well at all, actually. And so I didn't like that because I lost a lot of money and time and effort. I had so many failures because of that. So over many years, like I, I kind of stepped back for 26 years, I've been growing organizations exponentially. And I, I use the word organizations very carefully because it applies to corporates and startups and unicorns and government. And, and the exponential growth formulas would work in all of them, or, or at least, the, sorry, the process would work in all of them. So what happened is I ended up coming up with a blueprint, which is, which is essentially a, a process to help you find your formula, right? So as I worked with different clients over many, many years, it wasn't as simple as benchmarking, saying, here's my competitor, what he or she or they or whatever are doing, and we're just going to do it better. We're going to do it cheaper. We're going to do it faster. That doesn't really work. You can do that, right? But ultimately, is you assume that they have the right formula and you're basing it on theirs. What happens is the most successful organizations quickly find their own formula and they become very comfortable in their own skin. So the challenge with that is how do I help you do that? Because I cannot tell you how, for example, you know, give you 15 cases of companies we've worked with who've grown exponentially, and then all of a sudden you can copy it and it works because that's a lie, that's not gonna work. So that's the whole idea, it's, it's a blueprint. And so people really love this idea because they understood that there was no single formula, that they've gone through the failures, they struggled like I did. And, and so I found it out very early on, I started developing processes. And the most important part behind this blueprint was, was the process itself, because growth is not about the results, it's about the process. So if you're committed to the process, then the results will naturally come, right? The, the, the results are kind of a byproduct, not actually the target itself. This is a huge problem. I educate many companies and CEOs about this problem, and we have ways of dealing with this. And we talk about this a bit deeper in growth thinking, and we use it in the 10 day growth hacking challenge where we teach people like how do we develop the mindset and then implement it, you know, put it into action. So long story short, a whole bunch of failures of, of conditioning, 
uh, telling me and everybody else this is the success formula, I jumped out of it and said, that's not going to work. I'm going to develop a blueprint, which is a process going to help you find your growth formula. And that was the whole idea behind it. Yeah, because I, I believe in your books, you're you're talking often about the, the signals. Um, like yeah. you actually, how, how do I imagine this? Like when, when you start, you, you know nothing eh? because you, you can buy a book that tells you this is the winning strategy. Uh, implement it and you're successful eh? you, you need yeah. to figure it out on your own so you're probably starting out very scattered eh? you, yeah. you do you try to move in a lot of different directions and then you you, you feel it or what, what are we looking well, for it comes situation? okay so the starting point like you rightly pointed out is you start with the i don't know right now how how there's a very interesting story behind this so i call this um boardroom ego so in your field, you're going to appreciate this very much because you deal with more corporate. So you walk in and, and imagine you come to the boardroom and you have a growth problem, but but everybody seems to have the answer. Like everyone seems to be an expert and everyone seems to have, you know, some very insightful things to say, but there really is nothing on the table that's giving you those growth results. Right. And so when I step back and, and you know, what, it is a bit it can feel a little bit rude initially, <laughs> but it works very well at the end. I say, OK, listen, if we all had the answers, we wouldn't be here today. So let's admit that there is a problem and we don't have the answer. And so in order for us to move forward, we have to all commit to a statement. And that statement is, I don't know. And when we commit to this statement and we all can agree to that, the only thing left moving forward is experimentation, right? Because experimentation is the only way for us to figure out where to go next. Now, for unicorns and startups, experimentation becomes a lot more natural than in a corporate environment. In a corporate environment, the word uh, experiment can feel a bit uh, like a virus <laughs> or uh, toxic because the connotation of the ideas in a corporate environment that come with the word experiment are very different than in a smaller organization. So they assume high risk, high cost, a lot of time, you know, and usually resulting in nothing. Ultimately, the most successful of the experiments are the ones that actually fail. And, and for corporates, that's a very difficult thing to put money behind, right? So we've been in circumstances where we have to change our language inside corporate environments. So rather than an experiment, we'll call it a project or a mini project, a micro project. And we would have to change our language, although it's the same thing, and just for it to become more palatable internally to the board. And this is kind of the, some of the, the, the issues, the challenges we found. But ultimately, when we enter an experiment, uh, the other problem is that people are kind of looking for a success or failure. And yes, that's true. But what we're really looking for are signals. OK, and one of the best ways for you to learn these signals in the, is, is in the 10 day growth hacking challenge. We do this live um, on YouTube and you can watch how we do this with many organizations. So we run an experiment. We step back and we kind of look for signals. What are these signals? Either we're getting a signal. OK, that's that's a good sign. We're getting a very small signal it means we need to do some work. We're not getting a signal at all or we're getting a very powerful signal or an extreme kind of signal like that. And these signals essentially are not results. That's the problem. You cannot really link results to experiments. A lot of people will fail in experimentation because they link it together, but they're not linked. A signal is the precursor to a result. So if we do the next experiment and the signal signal continues to stay strong and get stronger, then we're onto something that eventually we can then scale, automate, and eventually then will turn into results. And so when people start thinking like this, we find there's a, a complete uh, transformation in mindset. People will start talking about, hey, you know what? Here's the signal that I noticed, right? So it's not the result, because if you ask, did you get the result? And the answer is no, uh, then there's really no conversation or the experiment didn't work. But in all reality, the experiment did bring you results. Uh, well, not results as in the end result, but it brought you a signal, right? And so what is that signal, right? And that's where you need to really focus on, okay, where do we go next with this signal? If a signal is just not there, right? Don't go down that path, pretty clear. If the signal is too weak, you can make at least a couple of attempts to see if that signal gets stronger. Doesn't get stronger, boom, kill it quickly as possible. That's why these experiments have to be really fast. They gotta be really easy and they gotta be really cheap. And there are ways of doing this. So we, cause we're gonna be doing, you know, a lot of experiments. So one of the best uh -huh. examples is booking.com, like from 1996, which is what blows my mind away up until today, they've been averaging a thousand tests a day, right? It, it, which is incredible. Right. And and so, you know, my like my it's, it's funny because my smallest client does 10 experiments a day. So for many companies, that's a lot. But when I talk to my other clients, right, who, who I'm kind of pushing up the scale, I kind of let them compete with each other. I'm like, hey, they're doing 50 experiments a day. They're doing 10. They're doing 100 because the, the, the volume of experiments 
is the more they go up, the higher the success rate at the end result because they've got so many more signals to work with. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's that's um, that's very clear. And then I, I would assume, eh, because when you're running 50 or 100 or actually already 10 is, 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 is quite an amount, I, I would say, um, prioritization is probably key then or how, how do you manage this? Like you probably want to have like a very rigid prioritization system or... Well, we, um, we we organize it by signals. So so if if we have so if we've got like um, let's say it's just a flat signal all the way to a ma major signal, we would put that in one category. And if we had a, no signal at all, that's one category. If we had a really like weak signal, would be another category. So we try to put it kind of into those three buckets, right? Where we don't want to be putting energy is things that don't work, and we want to be putting a lot less energy in the things that may need a bit a bit of tweaking. Um, because naturally it will upgrade itself to 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 the other category if if the signal gets stronger. And ultimately, obviously, where we want to be putting effort in is the strong stronger signals, right? Once those signals are like really strong, then we know that at that point in time that this is an area worth investing in and keep it priority as we move along. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> clear. Um, yeah, maybe because um, we didn't talk about it in the beginning, but I, I watched a couple of videos about a 10 day growth hacking uh, challenge. Maybe you can also give a brief explanation on, on that uh, for the audience. Yeah, sure. So so when I wrote um, the second book, which is Growth Thinking, so the objective behind that was um, there was really no design methodology in the space of growth at all. And so uh -huh. that's what this is. It's essentially the design thinking of growth hacking. That's what it is. So we took the, the methodology, we built it, we it's, and it was data tested prior to it becoming a book. So we, we run this thing called Growth Labs, which is an AI framework where we put a lot of experimental data. We took that experiment data and turned it into this design methodology. What happened is we developed this design methodology. It was one dimensional. It was like you read the book and then you just go action it, which works. But then we said, let's challenge ourselves and develop it into next level. How do we gamify this thing to take it to a, a, a point where people can see this in real life, right? So it's not just like they can read the cases and they go implement it and they see it work. How do you how do we show you this on a much broader level as a learning tool? And that's exactly what we did. So we created this challenge, the million dollar challenge broken down to $10,000 challenges. And in three days, we work on, uh, sorry, in 10 days, we work on three growth hacks to essentially 10x the organization, okay? So when we say 10x, we mean exponential results. So it could be 1x, 5x, whatever it is. But ultimately is that we wanna work exponentially, not incrementally. So we have to think differently, we gotta work differently. And so each contender, we develop five uh, episodes and you can watch them live. So you can see, you know, where we start, what kind of company they are, what level they're at. And then we do implement hack one, two and three. And then you can kind of get a sense of what is that hack? How did it work? What were the signals? Uh, what were what were some of the methodologies we used behind it? Some of the tools we used behind it and what really happened at the end of it. Then in the final episode, we talk about the, the overall results, um, things that, that were learned because the learning, the learning is the most important part here. Um, that's where you gain the next level ideas and everything that comes in place and you just continue the process. So when we did that, um, you know, people would read the book and then, then they would go take the training. We got free training if you buy the book and then they go into the challenge. And so it was just a natural progression to the methodology and it just kind of exploded from there. So we work with um, two of the largest uh, startup accelerators in the world, uh, Founders Institute and Startup Grind. Um, and so what they did is they would start actually sponsoring, putting in their top entrepreneurs into the program. So they would find the best of the best. Uh, they've got all their basic building blocks in place and now they need to grow exponentially. And so they'd come into our program and then boom, we'd just, you know, <laughs> work our magic on them. Yeah, that, so that sounds great. And then maybe when we are talking about um, those exponential results, would you then say um, the smaller companies the more um, or the, the bigger deviation and the more exponential the result, result, results should be compared to the larger the, the corporate corporation, let's say a Fortune 500 company, they can work with the in, more with the incremental results or you disagree? You say no, they should it's also- so, It's control. two different approaches. So my, my smaller unicorns and startup clients, we have to deal with them a bit differently than the corporates, right? So the corporates, uh, I'll talk about the corporate side because I think the startup and unicorn side is a bit more obvious. On the corporate side, uh, I'll give you an example. So if you look at kind of historically um, some of the previous unicorns, so like your Microsoft and Google and the guys that we look up today, like these empires, that these tech empires, 
And if you look at their history, at some point in time, they had to break up their 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 uh, organization into smaller units, and that's because they have what we call an asymmetrical DNA, especially Google. And this asymmetrical DNA is what created this exponential growth for them to begin with. But then it phases out because as they get bigger, they start moving into incremental growth. So in order to stimulate exponential growth, they have to re-break themselves down again, right? So that's why they get a lot better at acquiring new companies, building new units, developing new projects, um, running other experiments. So with these larger, more asymmetrical DNA kind of companies, you can work with the idea of experiments. <laughs> the longer kind of, you know, corporates have been around a little bit longer, this is like, oh my God, no, 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 we don't want to do experiments. No, we, we want projects that work only, you know? It's kind of two different uh, mindsets, but yeah. So we essentially, I mean, yeah, we break it down, smaller teams, and that's what Alphabet did, right? So when they went in, they, they, they created Alphabet, that's exactly what they did, is that they just tick, 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 cut them, and said, now you guys keep focusing on growth, and they developed an even stronger growth mindset within the organization uh, uh, by doing that. And you'll see that this same pattern is in a lot of these, um, you know, corporates that were just, I guess you can say, former uh, unicorns. And then would you say that, um, like, incubators venture arms they, they are on the rise more and more companies are deciding to um to set up their own would yep. you say this is also part of an asymmetric strategy maybe to... uh, yes 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 absolutely because you see what they have where smaller organizations have is they're more resource rich right so they have to utilize those resources in a much more effective way now for them they can go into their main business and do it but they maximize that right so the the need for a cvc or a corporate venture capital arm or the likes of become a lot more uh, required and a lot more important because they need to develop growth centers. so that's where they would go buy you know like microsoft buying a, a skype for example or a linkedin okay it doesn't necessarily link link in initially into their core business which they do find ways to do that but ultimately is that they're finding other areas of growth and other strategic alignments that give them other forms of growth. And so they're using their superpower. Their superpower is one, their money, obviously, but second is their network and then and reach the capability, their existing customer base. So if these three things align, then they can create exponential growth in different ways. All right, yeah, very, very, very clear. Um, so when we are looking at growth hacking and we we discussed, and I also heard this, um, maybe it was in your book or maybe it was on a podcast, where you say like the, the problem with growth today is that people are looking for the knowledge and they want to read books and they want to hear um, podcasts and they, they really want to educate themselves. But schools don't really offer um, that yeah. kind of course yeah. at the moment. They're, they're a bit um, lagging behind uh, probably in five or... Do you believe that in five years we will have a growth course in colleges or uh, not even yeah, yes and no like like okay so ultimately um so growth thinking is being used in harvard and stanford today but by students and professors not part of the curriculum so we see it already emerging inside the education system however it won't work the same way um i'm a big believer in the future of education being in micro uh, education so much smaller more effective because you become obsolete too quick. And, and the, the way that information can be delivered today can be in a lot more precise um, and more effective ways than they had been in the past. So ultimately, there's been a huge emergence of growth academies. So people teaching growth, uh, we've got our own growth school as well. And many of them are not growing. Like that, I know that sounds ironic. Um, and where we discovered this is we had a report that we published in July, I mean, a couple of months ago, and we found that 86% of growth agencies are not actually growing. And the number one reason was know-how and talent. And when you go into that to look a bit deeper, it's the training and education and experience is where the problem is. Now, in all fairness, this is an emerging practice. This is a new discipline. So by nature, if you look at any new discipline, whether it be growth or any other area, it's exactly the same problem. This always happens, right? What will need to take place is there's going to be major advancements in the education side and the type of growth agencies that are going to emerge. You can take a look at the report. It has, we go very deep into roughly 20 plus data points into how money is being spent on growth services, how the switching between different uh, growth services, uh, growth service providers, sorry, um, is actually taking place and the reasons behind it, which is even more fascinating. So because it, it see the, I'll, t I'll share with you something else that's just very interesting. So about 2019, we wanted to understand how many growth hackers there were out there in the 
and very clear about definition. This is not like a digital marketing uh, person saying, hey, I'm a growth hacker. This is people who are actually understand the growth sciences and understand the cross-functional capability and usage of this science. And so we had estimated it'd be like 5,000 people globally, <laughs> like in the actual practice. And so you're thinking like, that's impossible, man. My neighbor is a growth hacker, right? But that's not actually the case. So we updated it uh, recently, six months back, I don't remember what it was, and, and it's almost double that. So a, a, an age, a, a recruitment um, agency and in the UK, they have a global footprint. And so they read this report and they wanted to reach out to me through a growth hacker I know. They had, These guys are really interested to have a conversation with you related to kind of what's happening in the talent space. I said, yeah, well, let's have a conversation. So they wanted to just understand a little bit more. And then, then they turned around and they surprised me. They're like, do you know by 2030, we, there's a requirement for 1 million growth hackers? And I said, we're at 10,000 something. How the hell are we going to go from 10,000 to a million growth hackers in such a small space of time? And that explains why the premium for such services or as famously said in Silicon Valley, I don't remember who said it, but I've heard it many times. It's more difficult to hire a growth hacker than it is to hire a CEO. So there you go. Right. And that's why the growth agencies are having trouble growing. That's why the growth academies are they're just putting kind of anybody in there. And, and of course, they're doing their best, but many of them are not growing because there's so many of them. And they're, what they're really teaching is just purely digital marketing skills. Now, that's that's important and we need those, but that's actually not growth, right? Uh, <laughs> it's just a piece of it. Yeah, I, I find this a really part, uh, a really interesting part because of course it, it involves me. Um, I, it, it's, it's exactly the, the position I'm actually in at the moment. And like the, would you agree with the, the definition I, I'm coming up with for myself is that you actually, you have like this layer of more performance marketing, which is purely digital marketing. Then once you add sales and product to it, so you have marketing sales product, you come to the level of growth marketing, but then you're still not at the growth hacking level, which is yep. actually, it's it's so broad and and and, and intangible in, in a certain way, or I, I, I would still find it intangible uh, at, the, at least at the moment. Um, would you would you agree with that? Yeah, um, yeah. So what we so the way we make it tangible is we call it cross functional growth hacking. And in the book, we talk about this. So we talk about like, OK, let's take all the major functions of an organization. So tech, finance, admin, operations, customer service, marketing, sales, whatever, all of them. OK, and let's say what usually happens. So let's talk about what usually happens, which is what you said. It's like We'll focus on marketing, we'll pump up sales, and that's where the growth hacking will be, and that's it, okay? But the problem is what about operations, administration, human resources, and the technology? And so what happens is, is you've got this really strong thing that happens, and everything else lags. And so what happens is you actually don't grow. <laughs> you don't actually have growth. And so, and, and then you people get stunned that they don't know what's happening, because they're not looking at the, the whole thing. They're not understanding the science behind it. The science behind it is, if I'm doing something in sales, it has a marketing impact, a customer service impact, an operational impact, and I don't have to growth hack across all of them. What I need to be able to do is I need to understand how that works with all of them. So we had a growth hack once. I'll explain to you this growth hack. So we discovered that um, it's OK. So we have a logistics provider and we have our product goes to our logistics provider. And what we found is on the very last day of the week before the, the you know the supposed holiday, uh, for weekend, uh, it would be a first in, first out. So technically, the very last thing in just at that time is the first thing they got to get out the next morning. OK, so what that would do is it would speed up the actual delivery process. OK, so what we would do is we would push everything to that day and, and drive our promotion that day so that people would get the delivery the next day even quicker. And then we would have our customer service call for receiving the product within uh, 60 minutes, I think it was, of receiving it. So once we get the signal, uh, you know, that it's been received, it's on a weekend, like, hey, it's us. And then be like, oh, gosh, these guys are working on a weekend. We got this product really quick. And what we do is we like, hey, we would like to follow up with you on some particular feedback, but we're not going to do that now. We just want to be sure you got the product. And then we'd follow up uh, the, the day, next day or two, and, and then we'd follow up. And then we know this was a day that people would spend time with their families. So referrals would go up to the people closest to them. So it came real quick. They got the call. They didn't ask for the feedback. They didn't push them immediately. They came back to them. And so by implementing this, which is an operational growth hack with customer service growth hack, the product, product, pro product placement, all that. So it all came together in such a way that we were able to fourfold, we were fourfold in, in, in 30 days, our, our, our revenue because of this. 
and we kept implementing, implementing, and then we kept growing from that growth hack. So as you can see, we had several functions that were, if they did not align, if it was pure marketing, our logistics would crash. It wouldn't work. Then customer service would crash. It wouldn't work either. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> your automated emails and yeah, the, the customer satisfaction would go down while now you're over delivering actually. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I can get that. And then my, my follow-up question would be, yeah, because um, who, who actually takes the lead in, in such an initiative? Is it then uh, at smaller companies, let's say minus 50 people, is it the CEO that should be the driving force behind this? Or do you hire a consultant? Or what's like a good setup um, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, every company must own its own growth. Okay. And ideally, ideally in a smaller to mid-sized organization, the number one growth hacker is the CEO. And he will need a growth hacker working with him internally to ensure that the growth takes place, but he or she must still be the owner of growth. And uh -huh. growth is a unit that should not be seen as, as, as one of the functions. Growth should be seen above all function. So a unicorn has this structure perfect. They put growth and then all functions and functions will serve growth. If they don't serve growth, they get rid of it. <laughs> if they serve growth very well, they invest more in it. If they yeah. see a, a function that's missing, uh, they'll put it in there as long as it, it works on, it feeds growth. So everything has to feed into growth, not the other way around, because the other way around creates silos, right? When you deal with corporates, you see it all the time. So you're working with the, whichever department and you want to do something cross departmental and all of a sudden you see the friction go up, right? Even if it's minimal, that minimal friction, when it's magnified at a bigger level, it's ridiculous. It kills everything. Uh, and so, so it doesn't lead to growth. They're not set up for growth. That, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> no, yeah. indeed, and I, yeah, I, I think you you make a good a good point there. So, I I, I think if we then reflect on what we discussed today, um, corporates try to be asymmetric. Um, that maybe also try to experiment more. We call it projects now, but actually yeah. just um, try to adapt the experiment lifestyle. Um, try try to do that. And then the whole trend of uh, increasing investments in venture arms, incubators is actually very positive. Um, and maybe for the people out there who would like to become a growth hacker, um, well, yep. it's the best time to be because we're it looking is. for 990,000 more growth hackers 100%. in the next year. Um, Eight years, seven, you said, I believe. Yeah, like seven and seven something, years. almost eight years. Yeah, it's really tight. I mean, like the, the amount of intensity of speed of change and the kind of things that we're going to see by 2030 in this field is going to be phenomenal, like phenomenal. It's going to look nothing like what we see today. And um, it's really amazing to be in this area um, and to see these changes take place. And I understand your frustration. Like I, I deal with this all the time. I have so many heads of growth across uh, globally who, who are like, you know, they're experiencing so much frustration. And usually the number one area I find, by the way, is related to mindset and culture, because that's usually the starting point. If you've got the right mindset and the right culture that allows for growth to take place, then the rest with putting the processes, structures, and strategies, of course, strategy first, and then structure, and then, then the process, all of that seems then will all work, right? It'll come into play, you'll figure it out. But when you don't have that in place, you know, mindset, especially mindset, um, that that's a killer, man. It's a huge, huge killer. And the, the, the best tip for mindset is that you start from a point where I don't know, but I yes. will test it. That's yep. the, like the number one tip there. Yeah, exactly. Are, Hire people that understand how to manage ambiguity, right? So they're not 100% in the area of ambiguity, but have the skill to take ambiguity and turn it into structure. This is unique. You won't be able to hire many people. Like I got to warn you, it's a small percentage, but those are ideally the kinds of people you want on your team. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. That's good advice. And yeah, indeed, finding uh, even finding growth marketeers is really hard. Uh, let alone finding growth yeah. hackers. It's yeah, it's 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 nearly impossible. Um, well, all right. I think the the time is up for our uh, meeting awesome. today. But maybe um, eh, thanks for your time already. Eh, and uh, I think really great advice. If people want to follow up on this, um, where can they find you, or can they reach out to you on LinkedIn? How, yeah, how absolutely. They get... Yeah, like I think the best place to start is on YouTube. There's a ton of resources on YouTube. So you just put in my full name in the YouTube, you'll find my channel, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, and then obviously my site, which is just myfullname.com, uh, mattersabri.com, and boom. Uh, you'll find everything there. There's also, sorry, another area that I have that's very rich with resources, which is mygrowththinking.com, which is the site for the book for growth thinking. But that's where all the insight reports are and the blogs, blog posts that are really deep 
into you know what are the four types of growth hacks that anyone can implement, how to exploit them. Uh, we go into like a, just a ton of details in there, and it's a very uh, rich place for education. Uh, so it would be a great place for people to head over to to get more information. All right. Well, I actually didn't visit it myself yet, but I wrote it down and I will take a look later today. Um, well, thanks uh, for your time, Nader. Uh, it was great having you. And uh, yeah, I hope maybe we can catch up again uh, in uh, the future. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.